This podcast is brought to you by Knowledge at Wharton. Please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu for more information. Additional support for this podcast comes from Wharton Executive Education. For more information on Wharton's new leadership programs, including creating and leading high-performing teams and high-potential leaders, accelerating your impact, please visit executiveeducation.wharton.upenn.edu. While people in the business community hear a lot about the importance of work-life balance, it's often unclear exactly what that means or how one achieves it. Stuart Friedman, founding director of Wharton's leadership program and the Work-Life Integration Project, thinks he has an answer. In his new book titled Total Leadership, Be a Better Leader, Have a Richer Life, Friedman describes the four domains of people's lives, work, home, community, and self, and what individuals can do to integrate these domains and improve their leadership skills at any stage in their careers. We asked Stu to tell us more about the thinking that went into this book. To start out, can you give us a brief description of the theme of Total Leadership? The theme of the book? Yes. Well, the basic idea is that uh, you can integrate the different parts of your life in ways that you probably didn't think about before. You went through the steps that I kind of take you through in this book, which is my course, my Wharton course, brought to life in the form of a book. Uh, so the, the big idea is that it's possible to create value for the different parts, for work, for home, for community, and for your private self, the domain of mind, body, and spirit, in ways that you probably didn't think about before. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a trade-off so much as you think. Most people operate in a world of uh, thinking about sacrifice as a necessity, uh, that you've got to give up something in one part of your life in order to achieve success in another part. Well, now that's probably always going to be true to some extent. And what I've discovered in developing this course and refining it over time and doing research on the impact of it is that uh, those those trade-offs are uh, are not as necessary as, as we often think. And, and what it takes to get past that sort of trade-off balance mentality is leadership. And so the book kind of takes you through the process of developing the leadership capacity you need to integrate the different parts of your life to perform better in all of them. Do you have a sense of, of how many people aren't satisfied with their lives the way they're on now? I mean, is there a need for this huge you know, new look at how to integrate these four aspects of your life? Well, I, you know, I think the, the idea, uh, the, the aspiration to, to, to live a, a full and meaningful life and to be successful in, in, in life has, has been around since the dawn of time. Um, What's interesting uh, in in what I've observed over the last two decades or so since I've been going after this issue in my in my work and my teaching, my research, my practice, is that um, certain things have changed that make this, I think, a a more pressing issue today than than it was, say, 20 years ago. Like what? Well, the digital revolution is is certainly one. the the uh, the twenty four seven three sixty five opportunity to be engaged in work related activity has made it um, uh, has made life a lot more stressful for many people and and the and the way you create and maintain useful meaningful boundaries between the different parts of your life the different roles that you play has become a really pressing issue uh, because most of us grew up without the technologies that now are ubiquitous. And so the, 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 the psychological and social skills required to use these tools uh, are ones that we, we just never learned as kids. So we were having to develop these skills in order to keep up with the, the technological uh, advances that, that, have made, that have promised liberation, but for too many people have resulted in slavery. Right, right. Yeah, so how you break out of that is, uh, is a part of what we have to learn. What about the fact that companies are so global these days and so much time is taken up just in travel, which can be not just time-consuming but exhausting? Well, uh, 
one of the ways in which people experiment, and we'll probably get into this later in the conversation, uh, in, in terms of what people do to better integrate the different parts of their lives to perform better in all of them, is... Uh, is, is to reduce travel and and use new technology to better able it, it manage you know the demands of their time and location. Uh, so uh, while for many people living in a global uh, economic marketplace causes greater strain because of the assumption that you've got to be in many different places on Earth to get work done. Uh, the good news about the advent of the digital revolution is that. Well, maybe you don't have to actually be there mm-hmm. to get done most of what you need to get done. Uh, so, I think it's both. It, it cuts both ways, and I think you know part of the uh, the opportunity here and the, the learning that's that's required is that we um, use these tools, the communication tools that are available to us now, more intelligently, mm-hmm. um, and that requires some experimentation and and learning how to use use them in a way that works for you and for the important people in your life, including those people at work um, and family. There have been a lot of articles and and speeches and and probably even books on work-life balance, including the need to be involved not just in work and in your family life, but in the community and Mm -hmm. in personal projects that give you a lot of satisfaction. So how is this book different from everything that's out there? Well, there's a lot of talk about work-life balance for some of the reasons we just described. Uh, People are feeling stressed. They're they're not able to devote the time and attention that they need to the things that matter most to them. Uh, There's a couple of ways in which I think this approach is is different. Um, First, it starts with the notion that you can find ways of creating value, improving performance in all four domains what I call a four-way win, work, home, community, and self, by making intelligent choices about how you um, use your time and attention uh, that don't necessarily require uh, a trade-off. So most of the work-life balance approaches, um, or the conversation that that is current, is um, it, it comes from the point of view of... Uh, the employee making uh, demands on their employer for more freedom, more uh, available time to to do things outside of work. And that's the wrong approach. Uh, What leaders do when they try to create change, when they aim to make sustainable change, change that lasts, uh, they enlist the people around them in whatever it is that they're trying to get done that's new by having those people see the benefits for them. So in the total leadership approach, uh, what you do is you find out, first you, you spend some time on what I call being real. What's most important to you? You write about that, you think about your core values, your vision of the kind of leader you want to become and the world you want to create and the legacy you want to leave. Talk about that with others to get clearer about what really matters to you. Then the second piece is what I call being whole. And there you identify the performance expectations of the most important people in your life, at work, at home, and in the community. So you list who are the four or five most important people or groups. What do they expect of you? What do you expect of them? And then you talk to those people. You prepare for and engage in what I call stakeholder dialogues. Yes, imagine having these conversations over a concentrated period of time with the most important people. It's a, a, this is the, the peak anxiety point in, the, in this process because everyone is, hmm, do I really have to talk to these people about this stuff? And in nine out of ten occasions, what happens is that people come through that process with really new insights about how the different pieces fit together and what other people actually expect of them. Mm -hmm. Because most business professionals, most of our listeners, probably have the following problem. What they believe others expect of them is actually greater than what those people really expect of them. And you discover that gap when you have a good conversation. Mm -hmm. And well, what's the implication of that? Of, clo- of, of getting a, a, a more clear and realistic picture of what other people expect of you. And if it's true, and, and believe me, it is true, that people expect less of you than you think, mm-hmm. 
Well, you can then reallocate your time and attention more intelligently. And that's what people do in the experiments, which is the third phase. Be innovative, where people take on small steps intended to produce a four-way win. Now, to finally answer your question about what's different here in, in the, the leadership piece, when you engage in these stakeholder dialogues, you find out a lot more about what other people are interested and in, what their real interests are in terms of what they need from you and what you need from them. And it's on the basis of knowing more about what's really important to you, what's really important to them, you can then design smart experiments that really do satisfy their interests. And that makes it much more likely that when you create uh, uh, an experiment to produce value for them and for you, that it actually does. And it's entirely customized to you. So the last point I'll make about the work-life balance movement and its failure is the a problem of one-size-fits-all-ism, let's call it, which is uh, a not uncommon problem in many HR areas where, for the sake of um, equality, there is a standard policy that is implemented in a way that is universally applicable when everyone's life is different and everyone needs different things in terms of how to integrate the different pieces. So it ha it's got to be customized. Okay. And so this approach is built on your assessment of what matters, who the most important people are in your life, and experiments that fit your situation. So this, this process clearly can't be done in a vacuum then. There's a lot of interaction with others, getting feedback, giving feedback, et cetera, feedback, et cetera correct? Sure, yes. Now, it, as a business, leadership. What, what's in this for, for the business community in terms of you know, increased productivity or increased profitability? Well, it's, it's all about improved performance in all domains. Right? And so we've measured uh, and, and done research on hundreds of people going through this process to look at what's the impact in terms of people's the individual's performance at work as well as at home and in the community, as well as for themselves in terms of their own spiritual development, their emotional health, their physical health. And what we find is that um, satisfaction in all four domains improves, particularly in the self-domain, and I can explain more about why that is. But at the same time, performance also goes up. Not as much as satisfaction goes up, but performance also goes up in all four areas. Now, this comes as a result of people doing these experiments and devoting actually a little bit less time in terms of hours per week to their work. So let me repeat that. People are spending less time working, but they're performing better and they're more satisfied across the board. Now, why is that? Again, it's because they're, they're using their time and attention more intelligently. They're doing more of the things that matter to them and to the people around them. So the results are um, positive from a business point of view. You get better energy, better focus, uh, and greater productivity. We have some other numbers to report financial outcomes, cost savings, um, and productivity improvements as well. Okay. How important is it, or is it important, to have uh, mentors or heroes in your life in this process? Do you have people, do you, do you recommend or do you suggest that people can perform better if they actually identify people they admire and would like to be like, or is that not part of this process? Well, it is. Uh, one of the first exercises that I, I ask people to do in the Be Real section, the opening, you know, what's important, there's a lot of different ways of, of uh, getting at that issue of what, what do you really care about. And one of the most effective ways is to write about somebody that you admire uh, and, and then say what it is that you admire about them. Uh, many people write about family members, but some will choose historical figures or just friends. Uh, it's a useful foil for just contemplating, you know, again, your own values. Um, but you also identify the issue of mentorship. Um, on my way over here, I was reading an email on my BlackBerry from somebody who had come, gone to a workshop that I did at the, uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee at Olympic University back in the fall. And she wrote to me and said, you know, as a result of doing your exercise, I identified mentors in each different domain. And I'd never actually done that before. And I just wanted to tell you, this is now like five or six months later, that that changed my life to think about and to, and to cultivate important relationships in each domain was really important to this, to this person. 
um, and it is for many, and becomes a, an important point of focus in their work in, the, in this program. What are some of the tools in the book that you offer to sort of to, to apply these leadership principles and lessons? Well, uh, the, some of the exercises that I've described here are part of the sort of toolkit. I think the, the most critical that people um, report to me are the, as the sort of longest lasting uh, skills that they uh, both learn and continue to apply over time. And I, and I do stay in touch with alumni, and many of them come back to class to serve as guest speakers or as alumni coaches for participants as they're going through the program. I think the biggest one is they, that people learn how to innovate in ways that make sense for their whole lives. So this whole process really is one of being a smart experimenter, a, 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 an intelligent innovator. Mm -hmm. And so the, the skill that seems to last most of all, uh, like some of these experiments fail. You design an experiment, let's say it's to exercise four days a week, and it turns out that you just can't get it done for whatever reason. Um, you collect data about what worked and what didn't and what the impact was uh, of what you did. Um, but typically, when I have people do experiments, there are three uh, that I ask I ask students to do or program participants, and usually one works really well, one is pretty good, and one kind of blows up. And all of them carry lessons mm -hmm. in them. You know, why, did, why was this a better experiment than the other one? What people tell me uh, months and years later is that they became better at implementing change, about driving change, and that's, that's I think, the key skill. Uh, because they're designing experiments that are, again, well conceived and well crafted and they're also encouraged to again align their interests with the people around them and and so they are they're more effective in leading change which is of course the the most important thing that that leaders do is is to create change what, what's the main reason that people give for not wanting to undertake this process because it is as you've described that it, it's time consuming it's yeah. a little risky mm -hmm. uh, you you have to involve other people who may or may not be as interested in doing this as you are right so why what's the pushback you get from people who say it's not for me well it's, it isn't for everyone uh, and and there are shorter versions of it so I'll, I'll be doing a, a talk at a, at a company uh, tomorrow where uh, it'll be 300 people in an hour and a half and uh, it's a very different process than a four-month enterprise of you know meeting regularly and doing all this work outside of the the sessions I think the big one is uh, the big pushback is that uh, some people just don't want to look inside, yeah. you know, and 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 spend the time thinking about their what really matters to them and how they're actually living because it's either they're just not ready because they're not mature enough or they haven't thought about it enough. Although I find that undergrads, many really do powerful work in this; uh, they're ripe for the questions. Um, but some find it either too uncomfortable to explore the gap between what matters and, and how they're yeah, actually, right. yeah. So what's the main takeaway that you want people to get from your book? I think the, the main idea uh, and, and the reason I'm, I'm so enthusiastic about uh, what I've observed as a result of people undertaking this um, enterprise, this, this practice, if you will, is uh, is a greater sense of uh, control and freedom in living in ways that are uh, consistent with what you're passionate about, what you really care about. And, and I find that when people do that, when they take even a small step that's under their control, that's that's intentional, that's in a direction that they choose, that they uh, that they feel better about their lives and about the people that they're affecting with their with their actions on a, on a daily basis and that's just very gratifying to see and and I think the the reason that I'm uh, excited about it is that it's possible for just about anybody to do that if you're willing to make the uh, the small investment that's required great thanks Stu it's been very interesting well thank you Robbie sure I've enjoyed it thank you for more information, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu.